Good evening and welcome to Chat Room, coming to you tonight from the wonderful Napier Public Library. My guest this evening is a music teacher, a performer and a writer who's just had the launch of her second book. It's my pleasure to welcome Marianne Scott. Hi Marianne. Thank you. Thank you okay, Kevin. so we don't want to give away, you know, all about coming home to roost, but tell us a little bit about this novel. It's, it's not a boy book and yet it's very much about boys, so it's for all teenagers and perhaps parents, they could. Um, it's about a boy who's really mucked up and his father has had enough and sends him down to Wellington to do an apprenticeship, an electrical apprenticeship and when he's down there he hears from his old girlfriend that she's after him and we all know why, it's a timeless problem. So it's not so much the situation of what happens to my protagonist, it's how he doesn't handle it. Mm. Mm. He just goes to ground. Mm. Now, you are the mother of four sons. I guess it would be understandable if a lot of people asked you, did this happen to your family, mm. within mm. your family? So much did happen, Catherine, but actually not this. Although I do remember one of the boys was in big trouble and, I, and he'd got into trouble and one of his mates had got away with the same crime. And I said, well, how does he feel? You know, he must feel bad about you being in so much trouble. He said, no, he's got much more to worry about, mum. His girlfriend's pregnant and his parents don't know yet. And I remember thinking, oh, so that's much more to worry about, is it? Mm. Mm. That's how mm. boys think. Mm. But no one was prepared to help that boy or tell his parents or dob him in. Mm. Mm. It's just that timeless sort of quiet male thinking. Mm. Now I believe this is probably the first homegrown novel that actually deals with teenage pregnancy from the male protagonist's point of view. Was that a conscious decision of all yours or did you find out afterwards, gosh there hasn't been any other novel yeah. written about this? No definitely wasn't a conscious decision. I heard about this novel or I thought about this novel because I ran into an old friend and you know that sort of thing that we always say to each other, how are you boys? And she said once, well not so good actually, and that's unusual in itself because we mostly pretend that everything's fine. So she went on to tell me about her son and the story shocked me and I could feel myself picking up my pen in my head even as she was telling me. So I thought about it for months and then I, I mm. just started writing him. Mm. Now the character, Elliot Barnard, wonderful name, <laughs> how, did you, how did you come to that? Well, I was sitting reading the paper one day, still thinking about my story. I was reading the Dominion Post death notices and there was an Elliot and I thought, Elliot, that's a good name. And further down was a Barnard and then I thought to myself, I bet his mates would call him Rooster. Mm. And it was simply, I just stood up and started writing his story. Mm. And of course we got Coming Home to Roost, which is a wonderful play on, play on words as well. Mm. Yes, I, yeah, I mm. tried to change that title. I didn't mm. know if it would work, but it, once it's there, Mm. It sticks. It's as mm. much part of the book. Mm. Now mm. I've just mentioned that you are mother to four sons. How involved do they get in your writing? Are, are, are they very critical? Um, Helpful? Yeah, they are actually. They're pretty good. There's always sort of, depending on their profession, might be like this, might be a bit of legal stuff or police involvement, so depending <laughs> on their job. And now they're older, they're not so worried, but when they were younger they used to say, don't embarrass us, will you mum? It's like, I'll try not to, but mm. <laughs> they were more worried when they were younger that there might be some sort of subject matter that was taboo. Mm. Do they proofread it for you? Do they yep. go through it? Mm. So, yep. because they are males, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, do they help you give it an authentic voice? Yeah, and mm. sometimes they say, oh, not that word anymore. No one says that now. I'm like, oh, thank mm. you. <laughs> but um, just the, yep. Yeah, they do help give an authentic voice and a couple of the things that happen between the brothers, I feel like my youngest son when he finished the book said there's a spoilt younger brother in that book, mum, I hope that wasn't me. So I kind of mm. like, oh well. Yes, I wondered if they would ask you that because mm. they must see characteristics, maybe not of themselves so much but of each other. Yeah. Mm. The brother relationship has fascinated me and also there's always one brother that can do something better than another. And if they're younger, that, you know, it could be hard to keep them down in their place. Mm. Yeah, I have seen a lot of that stuff going on and they worry that they're not keeping up. It's very competitive mm. between the four of them. Mm. And, and uh, are they close in age? Uh, it goes two years, then a four-year gap, then two mm. years. So it's sort mm. of two teams of two, which is how they 
mm. gang up, but they're just so tight as a foursome. Mm. They're just wonderful, actually. I remember walking into the kitchen, I heard them talking, and one of them said, are you going to tell mum that? And the other one said, God, no, don't be stupid. <laughs> I don't know what that was. I've never found that one out. So did you ask or did you just leave them to it? I kind of left that one to it because mm. it was ov obviously over and they all had it in hand, I hoped. Mm. Well, you know, you've got maybe three other voices adding into the conversation, so there's going to be some wise thoughts exactly. there. So you know that they're, exactly. all, in, they're all, in, all in good hands. And they are actually protecting each other. Mm. Mm. Now, you are described as a, as a writer for teens, but that's such a broad spectrum. Who do you think coming home to roost? What's the audience um, for coming home to roost? I actually would like to have read this as a parent. I really would love to have. And also, um, yeah, a lot of elderly people are reading it, like my mother and my father-in-law and mm. people that I care about are reading it and talking mm. about it. I think we all need to keep in touch with teenagers. I reckon that it's a book for all ages, really, but not too young, mm. perhaps. Mm. And I also think too good for girls, you know, because I've read it and I've, I've mm. got a teenage daughter and I think it was really good for her mm. to just realise boys think differently. I know. Mm. I know, they are thinking. That's one relief, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. They're definitely thinking, but they're just not chatting. Mm. And you, you know, girls will take a, a similar issue and, and um, maybe go round and round mm -hmm. and round, whereas the boys will just cut to the chase. I know, especially mm -hmm. when they're not looking at each other. They'll say mm -hmm. something really blunt and that's mm -hmm. sort of easy, you know. Mm -hmm. I used to often find if I was standing chopping something at the bench, they'd be more likely to talk to me than if I was looking at them, asking them something. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, a, a girl might say, well, can we go out for coffee and talk about this? So you found with your sons, they'd rather you were otherwise engaged. I've mm. sometimes taken mine out for coffee or breakfast, hoping they would talk. And they can get through a whole power breakfast without saying a blink on word. <laughs> like, well, that was a waste of money. <laughs> now tell me, how's it been for you, the only female in the house? Five males. Um, mm. It's been great, really. I do love boys. They make me laugh. Mm. I can remember certain things I could never serve dinner around 20 to 7 because that's sports news. Mm -hmm. If I was calling out dinners ready, someone else would be calling out sports news and I'd be like, ah, oh, hopeless. <laughs> you, you, you just have to understand these things, Mum. I mm. used to say to them, come to the table slowly so they'd all see who could get there the slowest. Everything was a competition, sort of, you know. <laughs> but no, it's a lot of fun, mm -hmm. a lot of socks. Of course. Now, coming up in our next segment, I'd actually like to talk to you about your writing process, which fascinates mm. me, so we'll uh, get into that next. Okay. We're back in a moment on Chat Room. Welcome back to Chat Room. So, Marianne, let's talk about your actual writing process. Are you very disciplined? Do you write every day? Mm. I think I might be quite disciplined, scarily so. Perhaps when I had four boys at home and I was writing Snakes and Ladders, I used to get up at five in the morning. But we had to get up early as children because I was part of a big family. We all had to do music practices. But it is a softer era because I would get up and have two heaters ready to go <laughs> <laughs> and then write until the real boys were ready to wake up. Mm. And now it's easier because they've all left home. But in some ways getting up at five in the morning is still the answer. Mm. And, and do, you, do you write on a computer or do yeah. you, you, you do that? I yeah. write on my laptop and sometimes I'm flying Mm. And other days it's just a disaster. It's mm. hopeless. And absolutely nothing happens and, you know. Mm. In the earlier days, did that worry you? Or did you feel a little bit panicked? Gosh, nothing, nothing's coming today? Yeah, I think mm. it did. I actually don't have that much of a memory of the bad days. I can just remember the feeling of the good days. That was mm. incredible. Mm. And the actual process, um, I've got a sister who's an editor and she would often take a chapter when I'd finished. She'd say, do you want to hand me that chapter on and it'd just be fabulous. Mm. Do you instinctively know when you've written something good? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think so, actually. And I can remember in Snakes and Ladders, there's a scene where I cried and I thought, it's so weird. And I thought, well, if I cry, maybe other people will cry. And that has been the most talked about scene, really. Mm. So, and if I laugh, then maybe other people will laugh. Mm. Mm. I've read that you describe the writing process as foraging. That's mm. a great word, but, but what do you mean by that? Well, I'm sort of always listening in. Like the other night I heard two of the boys talking to their third brother in London who's mm. just got engaged. And the way they talked about it, 
they were actually digging for details without asking him anything too much straight out. So I'm sort of, even as I was working away, listening into their conversation on Skype, I was foraging. Mm. I was thinking, oh, is that how you'd say that? Mm. Because they don't say it the same as we would. No, they don't. No, true. So do you know beforehand, do you spend a lot of time with your plot and your characters before you actually start um, on the laptop? No. No, if I haven't got it there, I just try and hit the laptop as if I'm going for a run. I hope wow. something will come. But I do spend a lot of time at night. Sometimes I can't get to sleep because I'm thinking and thinking mm -hmm. about what a character might do or what, mm -hmm. would their, what would be their reason. I think that's often a driving mm -hmm. force. Mm. Because it has to be authentic, it has to yeah. be real. And yeah. you've got to be able to read it and go, yes, I can see that happening. Exactly. Or you lose your audience. Yeah. And if mm. you don't have a reason for doing something, then people don't believe you'd do it. Mm. Do you always know your ending before you start? No, I've changed the ending and coming home to roost so many times. I just, and people keep saying, couldn't it have gone the other way? I say, well, mm. yes, it did for a while, mm. but I, I won't mm. talk any more about that in case I spoil it. Absolutely. <laughs> mm. Of course, we are all flawed human beings, mm. but is the success of a good book somehow making your character not only believable, but likeable? Yes, I do think so. And also, perhaps he has to grow. Mm. Characters have to maybe learn something or come through mm. something really hard. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm only learning all of this stuff myself. Some of it was instinctive. And some of it, I've done a writing course, and people say you can't learn to write, but actually, mm, I think you probably mm. can. You can learn to get better. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Mm. I, I think you're a creative person or not, but yeah. you definitely learn to get better. So where did you do your writing course? Uh, Fitty Raya in mm. Wellington. I went down mm. every month, and the, Mandy Hager took the course. She was fantastic. I just mm. learned so much that year. Mm. Now, don't you have to, on that course, write a short story? or You've got to be writing or, a novel. Oh, be writing a novel. Wow, so was that Snakes and Ladders? No, it was this one. It was this one. That's interesting, because Snakes and Ladders came out in 2012. Yeah. So we've had a four-year gap. I know. Have you been writing other things along the yes, way? Yes, I have. And, but it takes a long time to get something published. Mm. You have to do a lot of mm. begging and stalking and praying somehow mm. to get someone to accept it. To, mm. And then one publisher said, we'll look at it again in a year if you take mm. out the first four chapters mm. and write it in as backstory. I oh, so depressed about oh, that. No. I know, mm. but mm. I did do it. Mm. But and, and they, so, they didn't take mm. the book in the end. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Now, Snakes and Ladders did very well. Uh, was shortlisted for some awards, actually won a Reader's Choice Award for mm. Young Adult Fiction. That was fantastic. So when your first book does so well, mm -hmm. is it harder writing the second? Um, yeah, I think it mm. was harder. I don't know, I didn't think about that stuff too much. It was just hard writing again, starting off with a whole new family and, yeah. Mm. I do love it though. Mm. It's not all hard, it's just so much fun. Mm. Well in some ways too I guess it would, would be nice if you could actually write sequels to, mm. to some of these and as we've, we've talked about off camera there's definitely some other places you could go with Coming Home to Roost but we don't want to, no. don't, don't, don't want to spoil that. So many people have already suggested sequels, there's probably three or four ideas I've been given so far. Mm. So watch the space. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Now as we talked about in the introduction you're also an accomplished music teacher, performer, yourself and you actually spend not only having the four, four sons but you actually with your teaching spend a lot of time with young people yeah and again I read somewhere where you talked about it's really important you think for teenagers to have someone who's not a parent mm. to have one-on-one -on -one time with why do you think that's so important because especially with a music teacher there's some continuity there so I often have students that I might have taught say over a nine-year period and if they're coming once mm. a week it's amazing to see them come from little children to teenagers going to balls and telling me their mm. stories. And So when they come back from overseas or they have a 21st, it's really lovely to go there mm. and be part of that. Mm. So yeah, I do think it's good to have someone who's not your mother or father. Or maybe I can recognise that their eyesight is failing a bit mm. or that maybe they're not very well. or mm. it's, it's someone else who's just a bit removed but mm. still cares about them. And I guess too for, for the young person there's that safety as well, mm. you know, that it's not mum and dad I'm talking to. Sometimes they probably try things out on you first I before know. maybe they have to tell mum or dad. I know, I know. Mm. Often sort of prize a little bit of info out of them. Say, what mm. was the ball really like? Mm. <laughs> tell me the goss. Mm. And they do, they're fantastic. 
but just don't tell mum or dad. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> Tonight we're hearing from author Mary Ann Scott. More in a moment. Welcome back to Chatroom. Mary Ann, I need to mention your mum. Of ah, course, yes. the wonderful writer Joy Watson. You know, I've still got a collection of, of you know, grandpa's slippers, grandpa's shorts sitting at home. Wonderful children's writer. Mm. Does that make it harder, though, to write when you have a parent who is so successful, even though you're different genres? Is that maybe why you came to writing a little later? No. In fact, I came to writing the same age as mum did, surprisingly. Mm. We both had our first novels published at an age around about 50. Mm. And... Um, Oh, she's just been so enthusiastic and encouraging and excited. She has loved it and it's been great for mum's life to have had chances to get away to other schools. She loved doing school visits. Mm. It's been amazing for mum. Mm. Because you two have gone together, haven't you? We've mm. tried to, but the different genres make it tricky. So like coming up, um, I'm going to go to a college and she's going to go to the primary school, but actually we're too different in our subject mm. matter. Mm to be able to go very often, but we do speak together mm. quite often. Mm. Mm. So as you said, you know, your first novel at the age of 50, but you'd been writing a long time before that. Let's talk a little bit about your childhood, because obviously that's contributed hugely yeah. to your creativity. <clears throat> you one of nine children. Yes. And yes. all very musical. I believe two instruments each. Well, it was a pretty regimented mm. upbringing. So yes, we all had to do two hours practice a day and we were we had an alarm system and we had a roster on the wall that looked like something like an airline's timetable. You'd look down and see which piano room you were in and it was so organised, it was unbelievable. And um, it was freezing, big, big house, you know, Hawke's Bay winters and you'd be practising away with just a bar heater to warm your ankles. They were, you know, and we'd say to mum, we're freezing, she'd say, do some skipping. So, certainly a different era today isn't it but it was fabulous to be part of mm. and seven sisters and two brothers so we were as thick mm. as thieves mm. whereas I'm mum five girls and two boys five girls yes. and two yeah, boys yeah the, the piano practice you know I can totally relate to that but we were told to run up and down the driveway and warm up <laughs> yes or do press-ups mm. I know mm. so you had enough for an orchestra really within your family we, we all played different yeah. yeah different instruments we did actually we also have a netball team seven girls with net but we have sung together as a group of seven mm. women we sang at Black Barn once, and it was just amazing. Because oh, my older beautiful. sister Liz is a vocal coach, so she trains us. Mm. So isn't it interesting, even though it was obviously quite regimented to you as a child, it hasn't taken away no. your love of performing? No, no, and now when we party together, mm. it's all around music and singing, of course, which is fantastic. Mm. So obviously music was one creative outlet. Where did books fit in your childhood? Well, actually going to the library was about the most exciting thing that happened for us sometimes on a Saturday. And we take boxes and boxes of books in. And those librarians, you know, they're amazing people. They didn't sort of pull faces when we trooped through the door. But we didn't have a lot of TV and sort of not a lot of radio. So reading was the biggest pastime of all. And I was just constantly engrossed in books. Mm. I always kind of hoped I was adopted and that there was something else out there for me that <laughs> would turn out I really wasn't meant for this cruel regimented life but now of course I wouldn't swap it. No and, and what did you like to read because of course back in our day there wasn't this category no. called teen, no, teen fiction. No there was nothing. Mm. I can remember my grandmother had a bookshelf and she specifically said don't touch the bottom shelf so that was the most appealing shelf of, of all and I loved family sagas you know like the Jelna series probably no one's ever heard of them now. Maiso de la Rouge I was so fascinated by his name and or her name so no, I was a big family saga girl. I love families and dramas and families. Mm -hmm. So that of course leads me to the next question. There has to be a novel around your family, <laughs> surely. Family um, saga, family dramas, all those girls. Imagine trying to get approval from everybody. Mm. Well, that would be a problem <laughs> Can probably. I tell that story about, so like, no. No. <laughs> mm. Do so, you think about it though? Um, I do blog about it. I, rem I do have a little blog that I, I like to write about that sort of stuff. Mm. Yes, I read the one where you talked about your sister Elizabeth, mm. the eldest sister in the family. <laughs> because of course, if you read the books, you know, depending on where you're born in a family, oh, you have different characteristics. Totally. And you're second born. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I was like the top dog without mm. any of the responsibility. Mm. It was a great position, mm. second. 
Whereas what Elizabeth was cooking a roast dinner at eight. I know. Yes, I did happen to point that out to my 14 year old daughter. See? I know. Mm. I know. She's still got a finger on the pulse. She, yes. Yeah, she's yes. Amazing. So even though, you know, we seem to get closer as we age, is she still uh, like um, that within the family? Yeah, she's, yeah, I think she is still feeling responsible. Mm. Mm. Oh, she's fabulous. She, but actually, anybody would be there. Be there in a shot if something goes wrong. Mm. It's a great family for rallying. We all like to get on a plane. Mm. Well, isn't that interesting? Because in this coming home to roost, in the end, a great family for rallying. I know. Mm. Mm. It's the thing, you know, that family, they weren't privileged financially, but they were privileged because they had that backing and love. Mm. But he kind of didn't trust it, did he? Mm. No, no. Yes. Almost until it was too late. Mm. Yeah, but we won't give away it anymore. Mm. Mm. So the other thing I'm wondering about you writing, is a parenting book. Have you thought about that? <laughs> um, yes, I would quite like to. I don't think I'm an expert, but I do feel perhaps as if I might have one or two things to offer just through the harsh reality of learning them myself. And I remember when we were young, there were seven teenagers at once, oh. and mum used to say those were her happiest days. And in some ways we're so terrified of teenagers now we forget to enjoy them. Mm. Mm. Actually, there are lots of really, really happy things. The house is pretty empty now. Mm. I'd love to go back. And there are lots of wonderful things actually about being a teenager. Oh, and absolutely. I, but I think as parents, sometimes we need to remind them of that. Oh, without a doubt. Mm. And those friendships, unconditional friendships, aren't they? Mm. Yeah. And that tomorrow will be a new day. Yes, exactly. And, it, and that I'm a big believer mm. in sleep on it. Yes, and maybe talk to somebody. <laughs> mm. Who's not necessarily mum, exactly. mum or dad? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, is there another novel coming? Yes. Well, I started writing, of all things, some hunting books because I just wanted to go for a lower age group. You know, the age group I've been dealing with has some big issues: mm. drug, sex, and rock and roll. And it's really kind of oh, mm. sometimes you it's fraught mm. with worry. Mm. So, I did try writing for a slightly younger age group, and I've had a ball. I'm really enjoying it. So, I've done a little sort of series of three, pig hunting, spear fishing and bow hunting. I know, I know, I can't believe I've done that. But I've actually got another novel in my head that's keeping me awake at night. Ah, that's a good sign, I think. Yeah, it probably is. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And um, do you have a chance to read? I know you are an avid reader. What's on your book stand at the moment? Oh, absolutely, I just mm. love reading. So I'm actually reading The Antipodeans at the moment. Yes. Um... I just, I've just started a book club, so it's the first time I've ever been in one, I've always shied away from it, so I'm hoping that that will, and I've also got the book club with men in it, specifically so we read a different type of novel, I don't want to just be sticking to safe books, so it'll be interesting to see a absolutely what they bring up and what they suggest. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you for sharing some backstory to Coming Home to Roost with us, and uh, as we've touched on today, yes it is written for teens, but I think parents could certainly benefit mm. from reading it. Grandparents, you know, buy it give, it, know. To, give it to a grandson, granddaughter, and again, a great, it's a great conversation starter. It is, isn't it? And, and sometimes when a grandparent gives oh. a book, you often think, oh, I've got a mm. book. But actually, mm. that's the gift that talks and lasts the longest. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. And um, quite fitting, too, as you're an author, that we're sitting here in the wonderful Napier Public yes. Library. Mm. Isn't it lovely? Mm. Mm. Marianne, thank you for coming in tonight. Ah, thank you very much, Catherine. Mm. And that's a wrap for Chat Room. I hope you enjoyed the show, and I'll see you again soon.